Welcome to the Aquas Podcast. Conversations about regs, funds, and governance with your host, Daniel Lawler. Wild Podcast listeners, do we have a treat for you? My name is Daniel Lawler, and I'm the Managing Director of Aquest. And in this episode of the Quest podcast, I'm joined by my regular co-host, Shannon Eastman. Shannon does lots of cool things around communications and management consulting. You can check her out at shannoneastman.com. And our guest for this episode is the very wonderful Mark Fritz. Now, Mark is an expert in the area of leadership at a distance, and he's been working with organizations for a number of years where they have chosen to have teams not located physically together in an office, but spread across some distance, often across a number of different countries. And he's learned from that experience and has been good enough to join us on this episode to tell us some of the things that he's seen, the good practices and also the bad practices where organizations and leaders are trying to uh, run teams at a distance. Now, in the past, that has been because organizations have wanted to be in this space. And now, of course, today, a lot of organizations have been forced into virtual teams working at a distance because of the COVID-19 lockdown. And we're so delighted to have Mark on board. He's able to tell us things about leadership styles and how to be effective, how to engender a sense of ownership amongst the team where they're delivering on the key uh, objectives of that uh, organization and of that team for the leader. So sit back, enjoy, get a pen and paper, take some notes. And uh, we really hope you you take a lot from this episode of the Quest podcast. It begins, though, by my confessing my newfound love of opera music, which I really discovered during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Hi, Mark and Shannon. Great to have you guys along for this episode of the Quest podcast. Shannon, how are you keeping? I'm grand and happy. Good to be here, Danny, as always. Delighted we have Mark here today. I know. We've been looking forward to this one. Big fan of Mark's. You have a lot to live up to, Mark. She's been very much <laughs> singing your praises. Oh, that's great. That's great. It's great to be here. Uh, how is lockdown life for you, Mark? Yeah, it's, uh, it's quiet. It's quiet for sure. Yeah. Stuck in my office doing lots of Zoom calls or other things and, uh, and just heading out to the supermarket for food. So it's been a quiet time. Have I- any of the cafes in Chiswick opened up? Uh, just for, for takeaway, but the important thing, I guess, is the, uh, the ice cream shops opened up, uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> and, uh, so with the good weather, there was always a long line for the, for the ice cream. Good stuff. I uh, tell me, Mark, and Shannon too, have you learned or developed or, 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 you know, taken on something new that you didn't do post COVID so that you kind of feel like I'm a better person. And when your grandkids ask you about what it was like, you can say, uh, this is something that I did or learned during the time. My offering here is I, I've started listening to opera. Uh, to you? So, yeah, to mm-hmm. opera, opera music. Oh, to opera. Mm-hmm. That's my kind of cultural development. Now, I have to say, because I'm a newbie, right? I, I'm, I'm listening to like the, the three Wait a tenors. Minute. Wait you know? a minute. Ha- has Nessie made you do this? No, I'm, I'm just <laughs> trying to show off. I'm just trying to show off. But uh, my worry is this, right? So I'm listening to the three tenors and I, I'm worried that they're like the vanilla ice of the opera world. And then when I get, when I get into being a hardcore opera, you know, an aficionado, I'll have to deny that I ever listened to. Pamela I am Rothman. not editing this bit out of the podcast, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> that was our agreement. What about you, Shannon? What's your, what's your, your, your learning, your development? I am thoroughly enjoying lockdown. Oh. Uh, I've podcasts. I've mentioned it to you prior. I've got a podcast, um, work that matters, human behavior, flavor, uh, stop flogging your podcast on my coming podcast. out 19th of June. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, you'll be promoting it. The first oh. episode is going to include you lovey. Um, so the podcast and Bushy Park, I'm oh, a big cool. fan of Bushy Park. Mark, um, I want you to imagine Regent's Park. Mm-hmm. A hundred times better. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds like a great park. <laughs> it's a fantastic park. More forest, yeah. less paddle uh, boat and lakes, uh, but it's a beautiful part of Dublin that I hang out in most mornings. It's just up the road. You've got a lot going on over in Chiswick. 
Yeah, so we have lots of different not areas, and uh, we can walk along the river, which we do at least a number of times a week. Yep. And have you have you any sort of self improvement mark to to tell us about, or or do you want to just flog something like Shannon? No, no <laughs> flogging today. Uh, but uh, what's what I really enjoyed is um, having the opportunity to exercise because I'm not traveling as much, and uh, and you know doing some real exercise. Uh, core strength exercises before dinner and everything. So I, I, I feel good that I'm getting in shape and I don't feel as guilty as drinking or eating as much at dinner then too. Good. Uh, helps the soul. Uh, tell me, so uh, like on the business side for you, Mark, your expertise is leadership at a distance or leader, leading from a distance. Um, and I guess, and you can, you can set me straight here, but pre-COVID, pre-middle of March, I guess your clients were firms and organizations that wanted to be at a distance from each other, either because they're international organizations with international teams or because they've chosen an operating model where maybe they're not all in an office uh, because there's efficiencies or whatever around that. But I, I guess today you have a lot of firms that haven't chosen to be at a distance but have ended up in that position. Uh, is that right? And are, are those kind of firms starting to reach out to you now and, and wonder about how to lead better and manage better from a distance, given that they've kind of wandered into that operating model? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody is now in that situation. Um, but you know, if you think about this, distance and culture are the acid test for leadership, right? At a distance, you can't see you can't see what people do. You can't manage activities. You have to lead them. And then when you're working with people from different cultures. You can't exactly tell them what to do because things get done differently in, in different cultures. So I think what, what firms are finding is, is that uh, they're really seeing who in their teams are their good leaders and who aren't uh, because they, it really requires core leadership skills to, to really lead someone well. Uh, that you're not seeing every day because you can't micromanage at a distance. Uh, you can't see what they do. You have to actually lead. Uh, is micromanaging leadership or is that just a really uh, underdeveloped manager? Uh, micromanager, it's really, you know, it's not really leading because think about it. When you micromanage people, you're more telling them what to do. Uh, and if you're telling them what to do, you, you save them from thinking and, and you save them from growing. And, and, and look at it this way. Micromanagement comes with a speed limit. When you micromanage people, you're operating to your head speed to keep everything straight to tell people what to do. So you're not using other people's heads. You're only using yours. So, uh, picture, so I think what yeah, you're picture. saying, if I read between the lines, is yeah. that micromanaging is a really poor, naive manager who has yet to figure out what leadership means. Well, they don't know what leadership means. And, and also, uh, probably the they would never be a good leader, but also some of them just love getting into the details all the time and doing their people's jobs to make sure it's done right too. So, um, you know, sometimes the biggest thing I have to work with leaders is they have to start letting go of something they like to do. <laughs> Isn't that largely down to their need for um, control and power due to a perceived void in their life that they don't have control or if they don't, retain control, then they uh, won't get an ideal outcome? Isn't it all to do with control issues for the uh, most part? It's a lot. It's uh, the two factors I found is not letting go of what you like and then also having a feeling. In other words, a, a good thing for leaders to think about for themselves is what do I need to feel in control? So if you need to know everything and be involved in everything to feel in control, you will always do it. Even though logically you know you shouldn't do it, but if you need that feeling, you will do whatever it takes to, to have that feeling so that you feel in control. So you need to feel in control through trusting people versus getting control through information and knowing everything. And so, Mark, when you're working with clients, and particularly now, I guess, and they come to you and say, we are working at a distance and we want to make sure we're making the most of it and doing the best that we can. What tends to be their current status? Where did they tend to be going wrong that they pick up the phone to you to kind of put them on the right track? 
Well, I think, I think there's, there's two factors. One is, is what we just talked about. They're fearful that uh, if they don't follow up with people all the time, they're, they're, people aren't taking the actions and, and aren't uh, keeping the progress. And, and the other factor, too, is that uh, when they start getting into this virtual working, they, they want to be on a Zoom call all the time. So suddenly they basically are just consuming their people in too many video calls or other things, and, and their people don't get enough time to do their work. Um, in fact, so think about this. You know, not every, every uh, situation needs a video call, and not every situation needs an hour meeting. So I think they're just – they need to find a new way of communicating that uh, gives their people more time to get on with it. And do you have a kind of cheat sheet or, or advice for when is a Zoom call or when is a video call the right way and when is video call just overkill or, or doing it for the, for the sake of it? Yeah, I mean, when you, have, uh, when you have some alignment issues where you really need to get people on the phone and discuss and, and, and come to an agreement, or, or making a decision on something it, that's really key or something strategic because you can see their eyes. But when you're dealing with something day-to-day -day operational, you don't need the video call. In fact, uh, sometimes if you're just looking at the same document dealing with an issue, the most successful teams that work virtually have lots of small calls dealing with the issue right away, getting off, getting on to things. They, they're not, you know, if you look at someone's calendar, and you see back-to-back -back one hour meetings, I'm telling you, they're not productive. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I guess that could be a bit of a shock to them if they think that, you know, if you, if you work with somebody and they think they're the hardest working guy or girl in the world, and, and you say, you know, you're really not being productive with, with that amount of uh, hourly meetings, hour meetings where you're, you're kind of micromanaging your staff. What do you do then to kind of take somebody from where we, they have, micromanagement issues or uh, too many Zoom meetings, too many one-hour meetings, to being very effective at leading from, from distance? Yeah, the key is moving them from, uh, from think of their job as managing activities to, to managing and leading achievement and progress and getting them to be really clear on the outcomes. And uh, to, to start off is, is getting them to run better meetings because the biggest problem you hear in business, regardless of whether it was face-to-face, -face, virtual, remote, whatever, people always state this phrase to take a meeting. We, we need a meeting to discuss something, but discussion is an activity. Um, there's only three reasons to have a meeting. You either need an agreed decision, you need an agreed action, or you need alignment, right? Because meetings are around progress, and if you can make progress without having a meeting, you don't need a meeting. So I think it's really getting people to be much more outcomes focused and progress towards making those outcomes versus just getting things done. Yeah, I guess being outcome focused is, is central because you're not, you know, you're, you're not there, set, you know, standing beside your, your team or your, your colleagues. But ultimately, I guess your concern is that the work gets done regardless of whether it's middle of the day or middle of the night and, and maybe regardless of whether it's an eight hour day or a four hour day or a 12 hour day. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the best way to lead people at a distance is to get very clear with them on the outcomes, ask them for the milestones, the steps, and then basically you follow up with them on the milestones. And if you don't trust someone, you might make the milestones a little bit more narrow. If you trust them, the milestones will be wide. So the best leaders are adjusting the progress points, the milestones with people, depending on how well they trust them. They're never dropping down to managing activities because when you manage activities, you have a risk of now you're coming down and doing their job. And if you tend up doing your people's job, there's not much left time to do your own job. <laughs> so what would you say is the... Um, most common reason why leaders step down from leading and get involved in things that don't necessarily support them or the project. Yeah, it's interesting. The, 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 the one key mindset or behavior change that has to occur is this. Often leaders who aren't good at letting go and everything, they judge people based on that's the way I would have done it, so it's okay. 
So they want to ensure that people are doing it their way. But to be honest, as you climb, your way is out of date. Your people could have a better way to do this than yours. Your how is out of date because you, you've done that job uh, before. So I found that um, you really need to get people to be better at asking questions than at giving answers. And the best question to ask is when people come to you with a problem, you say, well, what options do you think we have? And why would one option be better than another? Now you can coach them towards the best answer and the answers were originally theirs, so they're going to take more ownership. So is this where ownership comes in, Mark? Because I know you talk a lot about your team owning it, you know, where the leader leads and the, and the team owns and, and delivers because it's theirs. Um, is, that, is that where this whole ownership piece comes in? Absolutely. Because, you know, I, I, I realized it's towards the end of my career, too, is that my leadership success and the quality of my personal life was in direct proportion to my people owning what I'm asking them to achieve, both individually and collectively as a team, because they need to feel that ownership so that they're going to do even the non-enjoyable things that make it happen. Think about it. As a leader, you don't have to motivate people to do what they enjoy. You have to motivate them so they're going to do even the non-enjoyable, own it, so that you don't have to be there to tell them what to do all the time. You know, a lot of programs I run is uh, the title of one is why you never wash a rental car <laughs> because you don't own it. And it's like the same thing. If you tell people what to do and it's not theirs and it doesn't work, they're just going to bring the problem back to you. It's like uh, if you have a problem with a rental car, you don't go to the hardware store and then the, the auto parts store and go back and fix it. You just give it back. So ownership is absolutely key. And what techniques do effective leaders use to, to have their team own the work? Is it down to incentivization and bonuses and, and money talks? Or, or is it softer than that? Is it more about the way that they appreciate or trust their team, that people want to do it to, to live up to the trust that the, that's been placed in them? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. You know, money is a magnifier. Right. So it'll magnify whatever you put it on. So if you get them to take ownership and then put money on it, they'll take even more. But the first step I found is visibility. Uh, make people's commitments and achievements visible. They have to deliver or their reputation looks looks bad in front of their peers. And think of it another way. If you give someone a very important project, you make it visible across the company, you make visible progress. When they deliver it well, they have unbelievable pride. So now they, you know, some people will live off months of, of, of a pride of an accomplishment. So I found that when I used to lead, first thing I'm thinking, what do I need my team to achieve? The second thing I'm thinking, what can I make visible so I have peer pressure? Because think about this. If you have zero peer pressure in the team, where does all the pressure have to come from? <laughs> Yeah, you the leader. So it's key visibility. And uh, when it comes to adding the complication then of distance into the mix, so you, you're, you're a leader, you want to be effective, you want to engender ownership in your team. Uh, but now not only are you not on the same office block or in the same floor, you're thousands of miles away potentially. How, what what input, impact does distance have then on trying to be the best leader? Yeah, distance, uh, there's two factors I found. One is, uh, you know, distance multiplies. Uh, in other words, it would kind of magnifies and multiplies things. So let's say that you got upset uh, on a call or something uh, with a person and then you didn't talk to them for a week. They're magnifying that issue in their head. So when you talk to them a week later, that issue is huge. And for you, it's still small. So um, you have to be careful about that. Frequency trumps time. So it's better to have more frequent contact than have big one hour blocks with people. But the second thing is, is that you need them to collaborate between themselves without you encouraging that. So you need to work in an environment where people know each other well enough to pick up the phone and deal with an issue real time versus send an email. That's why it's so important for people to have, uh, to know each other's common interests. 
you know, football or cooking or, or listening to opera, you know, these type of things. When they have a common interest, they have a conversation starter. And they're not afraid to pick up the phone because they can create rapport with the conversation starter. That's a really good point. I like the comment around frequency, um, but I'm curious, given the conversation or the exchange we had 10 or 15 minutes ago, um, how do you maintain higher levels of frequency when you're leading across distance? Um, is it email? Is it WhatsApp? Is it a project management tool? Because you're not necessarily wanting to invite them to Zoom video calls or, or give them the impression that they're being micromanaged. So how do you um, advise your clients in that area, Mark? Well, I'll tell you, I, I can answer that by going back to my own experience in, uh, in the year uh, 2000. When I started uh, leading a, a virtual team, we put our best people down in the organization together and said, how can we most productively use the communication tools that are available? And they actually made recommendations. When should we have a video? When should we just use a messaging? When should we use text message quick? Um, you know, and so what I found, the most productive teams use the tool that matches what they want to accomplish with. So, you know, basically, if they're only using one tool, Zoom for everything, I'm telling you, they're not productive, <laughs> right? And if they're only using, uh, you know, uh, uh, Slack or so forth, and just only that, they're probably not productive too. So yeah, I found the best organizations are using the right tools in different ways mm. to make the, the, to achieve the outcome in the least amount of time. Um, so it sounds like you want uh, the leadership team and the team to have a conversation about the frequency and the format of communication that would serve them best throughout a particular project or a time frame that would inv involve multiple tools such as video, email, messaging, and maybe a project management tool as well. Exactly. And, and if you talk about it up front, and get everybody's input, everybody buys into it much, much more. And it, it's just not a long conversation because there's not that many tools and there's not many key things we're doing. But there's one really key thing we have to be very aware of, particularly now with lockdowns and homeworking and families and everything, is we have to be very considerate of people's sweet spot of their day, is when they're most productive. I'll give you an example. When I was leading, I'd always ask my people, when are you most productive, morning, afternoon, or evening? 80% of my leadership team would say morning. So I, I keep the morning away from calls that are mundane updates and things because I want them to be the pro, most proactive. And I, then I push some of those things into the afternoon. And I only put into the morning things that we really needed their brain power on a strategy or something like that. So be aware, you have to cater to your team's sweet spots. So you enable them to be the most productive individually and then put the team meetings around that so that you're balancing that off. And Mark, when you've worked with, with teams that, uh, that are at a distance from each other and they've gone through this process of identifying how they're going to communicate, um, and really invested in it. Do you find then that the benefits manifest from being a, a distance team that where an organization has chosen this route that they find actually, you know, this is paying off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, the first thing they get is, is their, their members get a more balanced uh, life and so forth, or, or more they can integrate their life better because of, of the virtual nature and everything. But what I found is the virtual team when they use these ideas and they put it into practice, they're much more productive than a face-to-face -face team. Because a lot of times in the office, you just waste too much time and, and, and different things. And everybody is very focused. And I, I learned this, you know, 20 years ago when I was leading a virtual team. And my most productive people were working mothers. <laughs> they come to work late because they drop the kids off. They, go, they leave early to pick up the kids. But then after the kids are in bed, they're focused with no distractions at all, picking up a few things by email and other things. So I think virtual 
requires one particular thing. It requires everybody to be more responsible in leading themselves. So it puts a higher premium because you're not there to, to band-aid someone's lack of uh, personal responsibility. They're somewhere else. And Mark, have you ever seen teams that have gone from being physically together to virtual go back to being physically together? And, and the second question is, after the lockdown, when the opportunity to go back to offices is there, do you think everybody's going to take that up? Or do you think that's actually going to be the, you know, not the norm in, uh, after lockdown is over? Yeah, I, I don't think everything will go back to exactly the way it was. The, the teams that uh, went back and so forth, they, they're more blended approach. And I think the, uh, the, the, what was started a number of years ago, and a lot of companies have it, they have core times where people should be in the office or they have core days when they integrate and, and collaborate. But I think we have to be much more flexible that way. And I think you're, the key word is you're going to see blended. But see, blended has to, to account for what the organization wants to accomplish, and it has to be flexible enough to give some freedom to individuals and how they want to work. And I think um, the best way to do it often is to get your best people together and talk about it. You know, people who provide input to something will always take more ownership of it. And the people who provided input become very good role models for the rest. And then using the blended approach, does that kind of overcome some of the difficulties, either perceived or actual, or, or downsides of virtual working? So, for example, I know I was in organizations, and you mentioned 20 years ago having virtual teams. So I've been in organizations where, where you could have done the work virtually a number of years ago, uh, but it was never, you know, although the tech was there, the opportunity was never grasped because of things like a concern that you don't um, convey the culture of the organization if you're not together in a room. You don't train up the juniors if you're not together as a team physically. Yeah. And also there was definitely an element of presenteeism, you know, being seen to be there. The, the guys ahead of you who'd made it to the top, they'd been there working long hours. You've got to be there if you're not, I can't see the color, the whites of your eyes or the, the bloodshot of your eyes, I don't know that you're there enough. Uh, so there's a blended approach kind of get, get the best of both worlds. You, you get to overcome those uh, perceived difficulties whilst also having the flexibilities and the benefits and the work life. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the key thing, you know, even if you're virtual, you need some element of face-to-face. -face. Uh, I'll give you an example when I was here. You know, some, some leaders would uh, fly people in in Europe in the morning, fly them out, not have a a dinner or a hotel stay to save money. But yet when people get close, it's not between nine and five, it's between eight and 2 a.m. in the morning. So one of the key things of a leader is to orchestrate the right interaction so that people get to know each other and people learn how to address conflict with each other. Because a lot of leaders, when they bring people face to face, they want a happy meeting. So they don't discuss any of the conflicts. And then the conflicts are done virtually. If you help people deal with conflicts when they're face-to-face, -face, it gives them confidence to deal with conflicts when they're virtual. That is really good. That is really good. Yeah, um, you know, you think about this, you know, if you have a happy meeting all the time in your meetings, you've got a problem because people aren't speaking up what they really are thinking. So, you know, having everybody happy is not necessarily a, a good leadership outcome. You want them yep. fulfilled and also speaking up. That's a really good point too. Um, and allowing them to be comfortable inside forms of tension. I, I can absolutely see how the 8 a.m. to, what did you say? When do people most... Uh, you gave a time frame when people bond most? Well, the people bond most, you know, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. over dinner and over drinks. They don't bond in, in, in the office. <laughs> so allowing that time, mm, that's really interesting because that yeah. makes them more comfortable to engage and speak candidly, even if it does cause some tension because there's a foundation, a rapport, and a relationship which, with which they're doing it inside of. Hmm. Let, me, let me ask you both a question, you know, can you really motivate someone 
you know nothing about them other than their work. You have no, no idea about what they do for hobbies or anything, only work. Can you really truly motivate them? No. Yeah, see, that's key. So would you uh, recommend things like, um, particularly in COVID-19 uh, scenario at the moment, we've got companies that are still recruiting um, director level and above at the moment, and they're being virtually onboarded and virtually introduced. Yeah. How do you facilitate rapport and relationship in the COVID-19 environment to the degree that there is a relationship and a foundation with which you can then, you know, engage candidly about ideas or thoughts that you don't necessarily support? Well, you know, I think you first you want to get people talking together. One of the things we did many years ago is we did a day in the life. So we had different people from different parts of the organization, different countries, different locations, do a day in the life. And people learned that each other had similar hobbies and everything. And when you get people to share, they start to contact each other and they have that conversation starter naturally and things like that. So I, I think the, the thing is, you're, you know, look at yourself like an orchestra conductor. You know, you want to make good music. So you have to figure figure out how great analogy because you notice the orchestra conductor doesn't play an instrument <laughs> you know That's his really or her job point. is solely to get people to work together and perform well <laughs> it sounds to me mark uh, and uh, i don't just kind of cop this but when you have your team physically together uh what however you've you've scheduled that it sounds to me that actually when they're physically together, you don't really want them working. That's not work time. That's time to build that relationship because you can do the work virtually. You can log on and do your Zoom calls or whatever. But when you're physically together, that's actually the time for building this rapport. Um, and whether that's over dinner and drinks or something like that. But that's how you valuably use your physical time together more so than, than working through projects or to-do lists. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the biggest thing that hurts businesses is they bring all their, their people together and then they just basically PowerPoint them to death the whole day. <laughs> right. You got to get them interacting, talking, generating things. And, uh, you know, the, the actual content sharing should be no more than 20, 25 percent of it. The rest of it is 75 percent interaction. We just had a conversation with Sam Glenn over at Code Emotion. Was it last week or the week prior? And Sam was uh, speaking about the three different states of a firm. You can determine which state a firm is in by how they engage and train their staff. And he suggested that using uh, PowerPoint slides for people to come in and sign a form saying, you know, we've got the training is the lowest, most poorest uh, state or form that the, the firm could be in, that interactive would be middle of the road. Um, and then he talks about another level above it. So in the area of leadership, do you have, you know, here's a really, um, here's the characteristics of a firm that's struggling in leadership. Here's ones that are like, they're okay, but here's ones that are exceptional. Do you have you know, some attributes or traits that you would assign to firms who are really excelling versus ones that need to do some more work? Well, I, I think the, the ones that are they're doing well are, are, are doing two things in my mind, which I always wanted to drive. First, they're collaborating well. It means the, the leader is not in the middle of the wheel, the spoke and, and go, going, getting in everybody to link, but they're interacting with each other. But there's a second one is, those firms are making the people at different levels making decisions and those there's and always a searching for the decision up front so they trust people to make decisions and i think the number one thing we need to hire for in people in business is people with business judgment that we can trust their decisions and, and this will sound funny but as a leader the fastest way for you to lose personal life is to lose someone you trusted making decisions and they left the company and now this the person that replaced you don't trust as much <laughs> of course you lose personal life within 
days. <laughs> so I think it's collaboration and it's decision making that are key for a very successful firm. Well, said. Do, do you find organizations that are very hierarchical, um, are they able to adapt to, do, to this and, and do this well? I'm thinking public sector organizations, for example, tend to be very much a pyramid. Private sector, say, professional services firms tend to be more a flatter kind of s structure. Um, do you find that, that more pyramid type structure firms, organizations find it very hard to have collaboration and decision making at, at the right level that everything's going to work its way to the top? Or have you seen organizations embrace this and do it well, notwithstanding? Yeah, I, I found that the, you know, like the governments and everything, the hierarchical ones, uh, they, they really struggle in, in this regard. Uh, where you see them being successful sometimes is when they create a project type of, of group that goes around and bypasses all the bureaucracy in the organization and just gets things done. And, and that's where you, you see it happening. It's unfortunate they don't take the reasons why they were successful in the project and go back and change the organization. Uh, the biggest thing I can tell when an when a organization is in problems is I'll ask a question about a problem and their first response will be is, I think we, the process is broken. Well, it's probably the process is not broken is people uh, don't trust each other and they're not sharing information and therefore they're only blindly following the, the hierarchies in the process. So um, I think that's a struggle and it requires leadership and it requires uh, strong role models to, to change it. And you can change it, uh, but, but it's not uh, a quick fix. It takes time for people to develop a, a quote, new normal. Absolutely. Uh, and I can imagine it is difficult to, to get that right in an organization that has a pyramid and has decision making and has head, you know, heads in the block at a certain level. And maybe it's harder for them to trust people underneath them. Um, but uh, just kind of wrapping up, because I'm a little bit conscious that uh, the conversation has just flown along and, and time has passed. Um, where you have organizations now, Mark, that have moved to distance teams because they've been effectively forced to through lockdown, are you finding that they're now only three months in, but still mature enough to, to start to think about uh, doing the things that you've talked about there? Um, kind of understanding that this is going to be how things will be at least probably for the rest of the year. And maybe there's good elements to it that we want to embed forevermore. Are, those, are, are firms starting to get to that point now and reach out to the likes of you and try and embed and get these as best practices? Or are they not quite there yet, in, in your opinion? I think the, the, the true leaders in these firms, uh, basically what happened is this opened their eyes to opportunities to, to work in a different way. And, and the reason it opened their eyes is because they started to enjoy a, a better integrated life at home now too, and they don't want to lose it. <laughs> yeah. So, so they're, they're seeing the benefit that way. Um, and uh, I think it basically opened their eyes as to, what is possible, what is a, a quality of life uh, uh, that they could get, uh, you know, not for, only for them, but for their, their key people. Um, but let me just say one thing is that every type of change, you need role models. Because if you think about it, when, when, uh, when you had a leadership position for the first time, you had no idea what a leader did. You basically copied what you saw. So um, in anything that you think about in terms of virtual working and everything, a leader's goal should be to create strong role models that behave in the direction you want to take the organization. And that's, that's really key. So it certainly has worked, I think, everybody, but particular people in leadership positions, spending some time planning how they're going to do this, being very conscious about the, the role model that they are and how they are perceived by their peers and by the, their team. Um, and not just to kind of wander into this and blindly proceed the way that you've, you've happened upon it, but to actually plan this out and try to make the most of it uh, and to be very conscious of it. 
<laughs> that, that, that's absolutely key. You know, you have to, to think ahead. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, if I had to summarize, you know, micromanagement, uh, you know, you don't have to think as much. As a leader, you have, you, to, do it all. you have to think more. You have to think about how do I move this ahead? How, how do I structure things? How do I enable the organization? So leadership requires a lot more planning, upfront thinking, because you want to enable the team to do it so that you don't have to be there all the time. Shannon. That is a great line to wrap up on. I love this conversation. Yeah, you did well, Shannon. You said he was going to be good. Thank you very much, Mark. Very oh, much. Oh, it's my pleasure. That. It's my pleasure. Great having pleasure. you. Some great insights. Thanks. Anything to wrap up from you, Shannon? Any last no, questions? I just wanted to say thank you, Mark. Um, it's great. Uh, great to hear from you. And I learned a lot in this session. Really good. Thanks. Uh, it was a pleasure. Likewise, Mark. I think uh, you really hit the nail on the head. This is something that uh, maybe four months ago would have been a nice to have or something that, that leaders and organizations might have thought about in very abstract terms and general terms. But today it's so hyper relevant because we're living uh, distance teams everywhere. And I think the initial panic is kind of over and it's time now to do the planning that you talked about, to do the thinking about how the organization moves forward. Do we really need to all be in offices? What's the cost of that? What people are we losing because they need flexibility in their life. They've got a young family or whatever it is, and the talent and the uh, expertise that, that that can drive out of organizations. Uh, this may, may be the way to capture it back. So that's wonderful. Very much appreciate your time, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, podcast listeners, for joining us for this episode of the Equest Podcast. Hope you took loads out of it the way that we did. Uh, we catch you next time on the Equest Podcast. Take care. You've been listening to the Aquas Podcast. For information about our training and advisory programs or our academy, visit aquas.ie. For more resources on regs, funds, and governance, check out our YouTube channel, Daniel Lawler, R-U-R-Q.